we need to talk about BMI. Hi guys, Dietitian MK here. We are going to talk about the history and development of BMI and why we need to move on from using, or we need to move on from just putting so much emphasis on this one piece of information. So today we're gonna to talk about the history and development specifically of like, where did BMI come from? Who developed it? What was it originally used for? Um, was its intention for diagnostic criteria, for a level of fatness? And then we'll go into, well, if you saw, if you can't tell by the tone in this video, we're gonna talk about the biggest flaws of BMI and why we should not be continuing to really use it. And then we'll, we'll also chat about potentially some alternatives because there are, there's other things we should be taking into account besides just BMI. So let's go into, I have my notes here. Um, it's gonna be great. So first and foremost, who developed BMI? So BMI, I apologize for, I'm just about to butcher his name. In the 1830s, a Belgian statistician, mathematician, astronomer, and sociologist started investigating what, I'm gonna butcher this as well, what Lahomomoen is, or essentially what he was trying to find was what did the average man look like? I will note he was not a physician. This individual's name was Lambert Adolf Jacques Quillet, Quillet, Quillet. He's Belgian though, so I don't, I'm not, uh, this is on me, I don't know Belgian that well. How to speak the same Belgian words. But I will note, Mr. Lambert was not a physician, so that's something very important to note right off the bat. So he's doing this in study, and he's trying to find what the average man looks like. His sample size consists of white European men, and that is kind of it. A lot we have to unpack there, but something I did want to note was Mr. Lambert explicitly said that BMI or this data should not be utilized to determine someone's level of fatness. He's explicitly said that it should not be used for diagnostic criteria yet. Here we are 200 years later using it for exactly that. So kind of let's dive into why BMI specifically is problematic. So first and foremost, we're gonna talk about the racial bias behind it. The study was done only on white men. So there have been studies that have shown just the body composition because there's so much that goes into the genetics of how someone's built that not all people should have the relatively same body composition style. So right off the bat, the the sample group did not include any people of color so when we're applying this diagnostic criteria to everyone shouldn't the found shouldn't the foundation that the data or shouldn't the foundation that the diagnostic criteria be based off of also include a pretty good picture of the people it's being applied to. Just my thoughts. The second flaw, or one of the second flaws we'll talk about today about BMI is it associates or it assumes body size is equivalent with health status. If you don't know how to, if you aren't familiar with BMI, um, I feel like, I don't know if it's just cause I was a lot of my education was in a very weight centric environment. So like BMI was getting drilled into our brains. We were always calculating BMI. And then even health class, like preceding my college education, we were learning about BMI and the different categories and how to calculate it. But BMI essentially is just your height and your weight. That's it. There's nothing 
beyond that, there's no other inclusions of data about your lifestyle. It's just a ratio of your height to your weight and that's it. So with this over emphasis of BMI, it's assuming that someone's body size is can be a, you can make an assumption about their health status essentially just by this one number and how they look when we know that's not the case it doesn't take into account body composition it doesn't take into account what their dietary habits look like their physical activity levels socioeconomic status if they have history of food insecurity mental health anything like that it does not take into account for that health status it's just what is your ratio of your height to weight and that's it the third flaw we're going to chat about today with BMI is there are a lot of discrepancies or the discrepancy that's present more so between men and women. Men and women have very different body composition makeups. Women hold a lot more fat in their waist, their butt, and their breasts. Whereas men tend to have like more broad shoulders and smaller waists. Um, and they might hold more fat in like their abdominal area. So the body composition makeup is completely different. And the individuals involved in the sample group that developed BMI were all men. So we're taking data that was concluded or data that was determined by all men and also applying that to women who have completely different distributions of their body composition. Kind of going back to the race thing, how are we using a diagnostic criteria that the foundational evidence it was based upon was not an accurate picture of the people it's being utilized on now? So, I'm gonna wait for that to pass. All right, the siren is gone. The, the fourth flaw we're gonna talk about is the age discrepancy that's present as well. There's been research that as you age, your BMI, like, healthy category changes. And I, if I recall correctly, we're learning, I think that like actually the normal weight category actually increases by like two or three points. So like, whereas like it was originally, I think, I think it's like 18 to 24.9 is normal it like increases so it's like 23 to like 28 is actually healthier for older adults there's been some research around that that actually like um no we don't want you this small or like your height to weight ratio to be this small it's like actually potentially more safe for your health if it's a higher number but that's not really being applied in today's healthcare at all. It's all the same range is being used for every single age group. As, as soon as you're 18 years old, they'll, they'll use like different growth charts when you're an adult. They'll use different growth charts when you're an adolescent, but from 18 to 100, 110, however old you are, they're using the same ranges. The fifth law with BMI that we're gonna chat about is I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier is it excludes a lot of different information about your body composition. So BMI is just that ratio of height to weight. That's it. It doesn't include muscle mass. It doesn't include bone mass. It doesn't include water weight. It doesn't include fat mass. It's just your weight. And someone at one weight can have a completely different body composition makeup as someone else who's also at the same weight. One of my favorite examples I like to bring up is just because this tends to build the best picture in mind is imagine a six foot two football player, American football player. 
and they weigh X amount of weight, whatever their weight is, and they're 6'2". And then we compare that to some like guy who's not a professional athlete, who recreationally works out, is also 6'2", but weighs the exact same weight as the football player. Based off of their physical activity regimens, I would bet my left arm, or I bet my savings account, we're not gonna actually, no. I would bet my left arm that they would have very different body composition makeups. But if you were to just look at the BMI, it would tell you the exact same number. So if we're using this BMI to diagnose, that's another whole thing. It's the whole, um, we actually, skirt, um, sorry, my mind is all over the place today. So like BMI is used essentially to diagnose obesity. That's like the, one of the biggest things I think it's used for and to assume health status based off of it. We actually have an Uppy, the Upti Dietitians podcast episode on the history and development of obesity as a disease. I will tag it here, or I'll link the account here in the episode. I'll also include it in the description below if you'd like to listen to that as well. But we do a very comprehensive dive into where obesity came from, um, how it's developed over time, stuff like that. But we're here to talk about BMI more so. So essentially it just excludes a lot more information that could be very helpful to determine someone's health status than just their height and their weight because there's a lot that, there's a lot more that goes into your body, obviously you would know, like there's a lot more going on than just those two components. The sixth flaw we're gonna talk about is the over-reliance on BMI as, as an indicator of health and how it's led to dismissals of serious health conditions. So I have not been, I've been practicing as a medical professional for a couple of years now, and I have heard so many stories about how I've had patients in larger bodies who would go in to see their doctor for let's say like a cough or a headache or whatever you name it you name it and they left being told that they needed to lose weight because they looked at their bmi and just made that assumption when maybe it was like a viral infection or bacterial infection or maybe there was some type of like serious or like maybe it was an underlying chronic condition that needs to be addressed but because of their weight there's there's a lot so much like weight centric care especially like there's so much of it that oftentimes the original concerns will get disregarded and i'm not here to say all doctors do this because i know there are so many great doctors out there that are incorporating a more weight inclusive approach where they don't just look at that number and make an assumption about their health so that based off of that they kind of include the entire picture in it um, so i'm not to say and i know that there's been a lot of like discussion about this and a lot, of uh, a lot of doctors have changed their approach to be more weight inclusive, so I'm not saying all doctors do this, um, but it's happened too many times that it's not starting to, it's not gonna just go away the more we talk about it. We have to do some more, system we have to make more systematic changes to that. And to be fair, from that perspective, like I, myself, being a dietitian, my entire education came from like a very weight centric perspective. A lot of the dietetics academia in the US comes from a very weight centric focus. And it took like being in the field for a little bit and also 
challenging some things that I was taught for me to realize maybe like this isn't the most helpful approach to our patients and potentially it's causing more harm than good. That was kind of a little bit tangent. The most important piece with this flaw is I challenge you, just Google search like fat phobic doctor testimonials or weight centric healthcare patient experiences. Don't just take my word from it. I'm explaining what I've seen from like a medical professional standpoint and what a lot of my patients have told me about their experiences. But there are so many stories out there that the people that have actually experienced this firsthand should be the ones driving this conversation because I, myself, as in a thin body, I cannot speak to this. I can only speak on it from like a healthcare professional standpoint, but it's really important to hear their stories and don't just, don't just take my word from it. Actually look it up and see what they say. The seventh flaw, and honestly, I'm gonna say the juiciest one because I feel like there's a lot of drama behind it, driving it, is in 1998, the BMI criteria actually changed. So originally, the upper limit for women for like the quote unquote normal weight was 27 and the upper limit for men was 28. In 1998, these were reduced to 25, what it is right now, or I guess, was it the lower limit? But essentially it got moved down. So the normal weight, the normal weight range was originally like this big and now it's like this big in 1998. And the data that was pushing for this change in the criteria was funded by pharmaceutical companies who sold weight loss drugs. So kind of a conflict of interest, if you think about it, where one day overnight, when these new, this new criteria went live, suddenly millions of people were overweight because the BMI criteria changed from 27 to 25 or 28 to 25. And when you go to the doctor now, you're receiving that weight loss education if they look at your BMI and just assume you should make changes based off of that, then there's more, there's more, there are more advertisements for that weight loss drug because, hey, we have more people now that are overweight. You're gonna make a little bit more money, a lot of bit more money, which is really disappointing that a lot of things in healthcare are money driven, unfortunately. But specifically with BMI in 1998, suddenly the criteria has changed, or not suddenly, it was probably in the works for a little bit, but the people pushing for that change were people that would essentially benefit from a financial standpoint because of it. So a little suspicious. That's suspicious. That's weird and a big conflict of interest. The last flaw we're gonna talk about today for BMI is there are some insurances or in, there are some insurance plans that actually have higher premiums for people with higher BMIs. So like we've gone through, we've talked about the history of BMI, we've talked about the different flaws and this is like one of the biggest ones, like this is the last one we're gonna talk about today. But with how flawed the BMI tool is, it's really frustrating that something like it, or something as like flawed as that, can then also play a huge financial component. Just like just because someone's like BMI is higher, now they have to pay more in premiums. Insurance companies are the bane of my existence. I talk about this all the time on the podcast, but insurance truly is the bane of my existence. And it's just really frustrating when, let's say like health is, I'll have to make an entire episode on this. The word healthy has been like 
hijacked by diet culture over the years. So like healthy looks different as everyone, but say like someone has really great mental health or taking care of themselves. And from that aspect, they like eat well for themselves. They have a good relationship with food. They practice like joyful movement. Um, they have really great emotional health. Like let's say they have no problems going on at all, but their BMI is like 29. They potentially could be getting charged more, even though like they're perfectly fine and they're doing, they're doing well and they're happy and whatever they have going on is like being managed well, but because of this higher BMI, they're gonna have to pay more compared to someone who maybe, let's say they have like a normal quote unquote weight according to BMI, but they have like a history of an eating disorder or they aren't doing well mentally and they, or they have like whatever mental disease it is or maybe they have like a chronic condition going on or like their diabetes is not controlled well but because their bmi is normal they don't have to pay as much on that premium i don't i feel like bmi is something one you should not should not affect how much you have to pay on premiums at all like everyone should be just paying the everyone should just be paying the same but that's a whole nother insurance thing which like i said insurance is the bane of my existence but that's nor here nor there so let's talk about what could be used instead of bmi because i we've talked about the flaws but whenever someone brings up or challenges an idea we should always provide something else as an alternative so Right off the bat, body composition could be something that could be included. Talk, looking at that muscle mass, water weight, bone mass, fat mass, just looking deeper than the weight itself could be beneficial. Additionally, like other potentially equally as easy measures to get are like waist circumference and weight to hip ratio, more in depth than just a hip height to weight ratio we could include that on top of everything we're, we should already be looking at as well some other components i want to bring up are like dietary recalls that could get you a really good idea of maybe what someone's day-to-day -day eating looks like we should be looking at history or current issues with food insecurity to know what type of access to food do they have? Do they have a history of food insecurity? Because that can play a huge component into their food choices or how they're eating. We should always be looking at lab values when making decisions. I know typically labs are drawn if you're going in for annual physicals, but that should be something that's taken into account more than just looking at someone's BMI and making a decision based off of that. And then some other components to include are like, socioeconomic status, history of mental disease. When we're looking at someone's health status, we should be looking beyond their height and weight. There's so much that go, more that goes into health and that's past just physical health. It's also looking at mental health, emotional health. Um, some cases like, in some cases, spiritual health as well. It's more than just the physical component when looking at how someone's doing overall and making recommendations off of that because in order to provide the best patient care we should be making the most individualized individualized decisions based off their specific situation and taking all these key components into account when providing those recommendations i digress so you're probably wondering i don't know if you're wondering this i'm making an assumption <laughs> or you might you might be wondering if this criteria or this diagnostic criteria is 200 years old and there are so many flaws why do we keep using it i feel like there are two pretty straightforward answers to that one it's cheap all you need is something to measure someone's height something to measure their weight and a calculator that's it and sometimes they don't even always measure you. They just take your height 
or whatever you report and then they weigh you super cheap it does not in the healthcare world pennies pennies to get that second reason we're still using it is because it's fast it takes less than a minute to calculate and if you have like you just put the numbers into your like electronic medical record it probably already calculates it right away so it's fast and cheap and oftentimes not even just in healthcare i feel like in like corporate america when it comes to like money is a big driving factor along with time is a big driving factor as well and that's why we're probably still using it unfortunately but like i said there's a lot of healthcare professionals that are going about beyond it we're trying to look at more we're trying to look at more than just your height and weight because there's so much more to your health than just that so bottom line there are changes that need to be made in our healthcare system not just bmi there are a lot of other changes that need to be happen but bmi is one of the biggest ones that i see all the time just because there's so much emphasis and reliance on it when it has such a flawed history the founder didn't even want it being used for what we're using it for or what we're using it for now our healthcare system has changed exponentially over the past 200 years our diagnostic criteria should also change along with that as well so that we're providing the best individualized care for our patients thank you so much for listening today guys i know it's a little bit more of a a heavier topic we'll say so if i just want to say if you ever went to the doctor and you felt ignored or you didn't feel that you could confide in them because or not even just okay if or if you didn't feel that you can confi could confide in that healthcare worker i'm not going to just say doctors because i'm going to say like almost every single healthcare professional has access to bmi i know has spoke upon it if you feel that wherever you are going whether it's urgent care your primary care a specialist you're in the wherever you are you're going for screening and a medical professional did not you didn't feel you were heard with your concerns being brought up or that you felt that there was a little bit too much emphasis on your bmi when maybe like your lab values were improving your mental health was improving with like your relationship with food whatever it is you're not alone look up other people's testimonials about their experience with fat phobia and healthcare. if you're in like a mental space to re be reading about that also if like you're not feeling like that if you feel that might trigger something please don't take care of yourself first but there i want to say and i know there are a lot of other medical professionals that are trying to challenge bmi and how much emphasis there is on it so we're fighting for you guys we got to keep the conversation going i always say we know we're making change when the main people trying to make the change and lead it or like from this instance like from a medical standpoint like trying to make changes it's the people that might not have as much direct like influence on that when they start talking about it that's when change is going to start happening because that's when it reaches more people and when it comes up more in conversation that's when we start challenging it and making change so thanks so much for listening today i appreciate you coming to my bmi rant let me know what you want me to talk about next time leave a comment let me know if you also have beef with what <laughs> bmi or whatever it is or insurance oh my gosh um yeah i appreciate you listening today and i'll catch you next time